Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Former President Trump today said he's officially a target in the January 6 probe. That's according to a letter he received from special counsel Jack Smith. New updates on the investigation into the Biden family. The House Oversight Committee today releasing a timeline documenting the Biden family's alleged influence peddling schemes dating back to the Obama administration. Trying to ease tensions, President Biden sitting down with Israeli President Isaac Herzog, also inviting Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for a visit. What's in store for the U.S.-Israel relationship? A vote to solidify support for Israel following fiery criticism from a progressive Democrat. We bring you the result of that vote and how lawmakers are reacting. An American soldier is believed to be detained in North Korea. He was said to be visiting the border before crossing into North Korea. Former President Trump facing more legal challenges as he becomes a target in the January 6 probe. This comes as a Georgia court denies Trump's bid to disqualify prosecutor Fannie Willis. Entity's legal correspondent Arlene Richards has the details. In a Truth Social post Tuesday, former President Trump said his attorneys told him Sunday night that he is a target in the January 6 probe. According to Trump, special counsel Jack Smith sent a letter on Sunday night. Trump said the letter stated, quote, that I am a target of the January 6 grand jury investigation and giving me a very short four days to report to the grand jury, which almost always means an arrest and indictment. NBC News said in a statement that two law enforcement sources confirmed the letter. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said it was an example of a weaponized government. Well, I guess uh, under a Biden administration, Biden America, you'd expect this. If you notice recently, President Trump went up in the polls and was uh, actually surpassing President Biden for re-election. So what do they do now? Weaponized government. Democratic Congressman Steny Hoyer had a different opinion. I think President Trump, former President Trump, has done uh, repeatedly things that call uh, upon law enforcement at every level to look at what he's done uh, because so much of it is uh, certainly questionable at best and illegal at worst. Trump said this is the third indictment issued by the Justice Department against, quote, Joe Biden's number one political opponent. He said, quote, the DOJ staffed and runs the DA's office in Manhattan and that the DOJ is in strict coordination with the district attorney in Fulton County, Georgia. Looking ahead, Trump said he expects a fourth indictment coming from Atlanta. On Monday, Georgia's Supreme Court denied Trump's petition seeking to disqualify Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis from continuing her investigation of him. This was one of two petitions filed in different courthouses last week over the case. Willis is winding down a two and a half years probe into whether Trump and others interfered in the state's 2020 presidential election. The petitions claim that Willis has a conflict of interest and argued that allowing her to go forward with her case would violate Trump's constitutional rights while he's running for president. Willis is expected to announce indictments in August. Arlene Richards, NTD News. And earlier today, attorneys in the Florida classified documents case appeared before Judge Eileen Cannon. Extending the trial date was a top item of concern for both sides. Cannon indicated a willingness to extend the case later than the government's December date. However, she didn't rule from the bench on any matters related to scheduling for motions or delays in the trial. Steph? Thanks, Arlene. Next, the House Oversight Committee today releasing a timeline documenting the Biden family's alleged influence peddling schemes. This as the committee is preparing to hear testimony from two IRS whistleblowers on the same topic. NTD's Arian Pazdar brings us more. The House Oversight Committee on Tuesday released a new timeline. Lawmakers say the timeline contains important dates as to when Joe Biden knew and lied to the American people about his family's business schemes. One of the main takeaways is that Hunter Biden was allegedly involved in deals with foreign nationals from Kazakhstan, Ukraine and Romania while his father was in office. 
The timeline alleges, for example, that Biden family accounts received approximately $1.038 million from the Robinson Walker LLC, which got the money from Romanian nationals. Lawmakers also say that then-Vice President Biden traveled to Romania to meet with people involved in the scheme. In total, the Biden family allegedly received over $10 million from foreign nationals and their related companies. President Biden has repeatedly denied knowing anything about his family's business dealings. The House Committee's timeline contains a clip from March 2023, in which NTD's Iris Tau asked the president about such transactions. Hunter Biden's business associate sent over a million dollars to three of your family members. Any reaction to that report? The release of the new timeline comes just a day before two major IRS whistleblowers are expected to testify before the Oversight Committee. Biden-appointed officials allegedly interfered with the investigation into Hunter Biden. The two whistleblowers are expected to testify on the alleged interference. On Tuesday, committee chairman James Comer told NTD's Melina Weiskup about the two witnesses and the goals of the hearing. Two of the highest-ranking IRS employees who were in charge of international crime fraud. So they're going to be able to uh, answer very substantive, specific questions about whether or not crimes were committed and what obstacles they faced in trying to conduct a thorough investigation. One of the two witnesses is still anonymous and documents refer to him only as Mr. X. Fearing retaliation, some Republican senators on Tuesday sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland and FBI Director Christopher Wray. Writing, we demand that you commit that no taxpayer funds will be used by DOJ or FBI to expose the identity of or retaliate against any whistleblowers. Arian Pastar, NTD News. And in an apparent move to ease tensions with Israel, President Biden today meeting with Israeli President Isaac Herzog. This came just days after Biden had some sharp words for the Israeli government. NTD's Iris Tau has more from the White House. And President Biden today welcomed Israeli President Isaac Herzog to the White House. The two reaffirming ties as Israel celebrates its 75th anniversary. America's commitment to Israel is firm and it is, uh, it is ironclad. President Biden reiterated his ironclad commitment and his utter friendship and love of the state of Israel. But the meeting with the Israeli president, who really just holds a ceremonial position, and comes amid tensions between President Biden and the leader of Israel's ruling coalition, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And president Biden has criticized Netanyahu's plan for a judicial overhaul in his country. And just days ago, President Biden said this about his cabinet. Some members of his cabinet, and this is one of the most extreme members of cabinets that I've, that I've seen. And President Biden was also facing scrutiny for not having invited Netanyahu to the White House after he returns to office in December. But on Monday, President Biden called Netanyahu and finally extended that invitation in trying to ease tensions. They have agreed that they will meet probably before the end of this year and all the details of the, the where's and the when's are still being worked out. But the White House also made clear that the agreement to meet does not mean that President Biden has given up his opposition to the judicial changes backed by Netanyahu's government. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tau, NTD News. And the House today taking a vote to solidify support for Israel. This following controversial comments now retracted from Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who called Israel a racist state. And Democrat leadership has sought to disassociate the party from these remarks. NTD's Melina Wisecup reports from the Capitol. Melina, what do you expect from the vote today? Steph, we expect this to be a very strong bipartisan vote. The chair of the Democratic caucus said that they were not whipping votes on the Democrat side, meaning all members will be free to vote how they see fit, which means we could see a few stray votes, especially coming from the progressive caucus. But we just won't know that final result until that vote happens. It is expected to happen within the next half hour. Now, there's three parts to this bill, Steph. The first one uh, specifically says that Israel is not a racist, racist state, and we'll get into the backstory of that a bit later. The second part rejects anti-Semitism in all forms, and the third part solidifies support for Israel. Now, here's the backstory to why this vote is happening today. 
This vote comes just two days after Congresswoman Pramilia Jayapal, chair of the Progressive Caucus, called Israel a racist state, only to walk this back, instead calling Prime Minister Netanyahu's policies racist. Now she can try to walk it back. She said it. She knows words mean something. But yeah, it's a uh, particularly with the with the state this country's in now, um, unacceptable. More than 40 Democrats, including some members of the Progressive Caucus, released a statement saying they're concerned about her comments, writing any efforts to rewrite history and question the Jewish state's right to exist or our historic bipartisan relationship will never succeed in Congress. And Democrat leadership quickly distanced the party from the controversial comments, hammering the message that this is not their party's take on the state of Israel. What do you say about the way Congress views the relationship with Israel? It's an incredibly special relationship uh, with Israel. We welcome uh, the, the president of, of Israel uh, tomorrow. There's, there's unity in the Democratic caucus. Anytime there is any anti-Jewish hate, we condemn it. And our commitment to Israel, and it is unwavering, it is unshakable. And Republicans expressing why the relationship must stay strong. Well, I think Israel is our number one ally in the Middle East. I mean, they've been a phenomenal ally ever since their beginning. This is not only important because of the values that we share, uh, but it's also uh, imperative to United States interests in the region. So Israeli's president will be here on Capitol Hill tomorrow to give a joint session to Congress. But there are a few members in the Progressive Caucus who are planning to boycott this. But Speaker Emerita Pelosi says this may not be such a good idea. From her perspective, here's what she said. I think that we should pay respects to him. We have to be friends to Israel. When our country was going through what we were going through with the previous occupant occasionally of the White House, people were friendly to our country. However, the large majority of lawmakers on Capitol Hill will be present tomorrow for that joint address. All right. Thank you so much for your updates, Melina. The Biden administration's latest plan to bail out student loans could cost even more than the plan rejected by the Supreme Court. This is according to a new study by the Penn Wharton Budget Model. The study estimates that the new plan on student loans will cost $475 billion over 10 years. That's roughly $45 billion more than the previous plan rejected by the Supreme Court last month. Under the new proposal, monthly income-based student loan payments will be slashed in half, minimum wage earners won't face monthly payments, and all outstanding debt will be forgiven after 10 years of payments for student borrowers who took $12,000 or less. The Biden administration said most community college students would not have to pay back any debt. A Penn Wharton economist says the new plan incentivizes future students, student borrowers to increase their federal student loan borrowing. And coming up, a House committee hears testimony that artificial intelligence will transform the way countries fight wars. An AI CEO telling lawmakers that military data will be the ammunition of the future. And special envoy John Kerry is in China. What can we expect from the current climate talks with Beijing? We speak with an expert. Wow, it's so soft and smooth. It's cool to the touch. How did you do that? Well, we took my pillow's patented bill and combine it with this new technology that we didn't have back then when I invented my pillow to bring you the best pillow in history, my pillow 2.0. Because of all of you, my pillow 2.0 has been a huge success. And now we're bringing you our best selling go anywhere my pillows with the same temperature regulating technology. Made with my patented adjustable fill and brand new cooling fabric, they're truly the next generation of my pillow so go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen use your promo code to save over 60 percent on our my pillow 2.0 four pack special you'll get two my pillows and two go anywhere my pillows regular 259.92 now only 99.98 king size just ten dollars more this is a limited time offer so please order now
Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. I can remember being back in medical school where it was almost a depressing conception of the brain. We're born with so many neurons that peak like around 20 and then it's just a downhill decline from there. But today, we are going to debunk this old way of thinking and use a new technology called the Functional MRI PET Scanner to show that the brain can be rewired to function much better. It caused an almost immediate change, and by better, I mean improved focus, longer attention span, better mood, decreased risk of developing dementia, and an overall better life. So get ready to be surprised and even amazed. This is really exciting information. As we explore what is possible, as we talk to thought leaders in the field, I needed to make sure I'm really that guy, okay. See the cutting edge tools they are using to assess the brain and hear from real patients about their dramatic healing process. <laughs> That's good. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. In a startling event, North Korea is believed to have detained a U.S. Army soldier. This reportedly happened after the soldier willingly crossed, from the, crossed the border from South Korea into North Korea. And TD's Jason Perry has that story. In terms of my concerns, I'm, I'm absolutely foremost concerned about the welfare of our troops. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin on Tuesday spoke about the soldier who crossed the border from South Korea to North Korea. The White House said the service member's name will not be released until the next of kin is notified about what happened. According to the United Nations Command, the soldier was on a civilian tour visiting the Joint Security Area, or JSA. The JSA is part of the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, where soldiers on both sides are unarmed. Former President Trump met North Korea leader Kim Jong-un in the JSA in 2019. That buffer zone is about two and a half miles wide and 160 meters long, and it has separated the two Koreas since the ceasefire of the Korean War We're in 1953. What we do know is that one of our service members who was on a <laughs> tour uh, willfully and without authorization crossed the military demarcation line. We believe that he is in the BRK custody. And so we're closely monitoring and investigating the situation and working to notify the soldiers next of kin. The service member is believed to be the first American detained in North Korea in almost five years. Representative Adam Smith added this. Obviously, it's a huge diplomatic problem. You know, trying to figure out why he went across the border is going to be, be step one. But regardless of why, uh, this creates a significant diplomatic problem between North Korea and the U.S. And as has been noted, we have not been in communication. So first step is going to be reestablishing those communications. But if a, you know, a U.S. soldier is in North Korean custody, we need to do what we can to get him back. On the same day the troop was believed to be detained, a U.S. nuclear-capable submarine arrived at a port in South Korea for the first time in about 40 years. This comes as North Korea has been increasing its tests of potentially nuclear-capable missiles. The State Department also commented on the U.S. soldier who crossed into North Korea and said the safety and security of any Americans overseas remains the top priority for the United States. Jason Perry, NTD News. And Congress held a hearing today on artificial intelligence and the military. One of the experts who testified was Alexander Wong, the CEO of Scale AI and the world's youngest self-made billionaire. He said AI is bringing about a new era and how militaries use AI can drastically change the future. And TD's Colin Fredrickson has more. 
we're now embarking on a new era of the world, one in which a new technology, artificial intelligence, is likely to set the stage for you know, the future of ideologies, the balance of global power, and, and the future of the relative peace of our world. The House Armed Services Committee held a hearing Tuesday on how the U.S. military should use AI. Key witness Alexander Wong, the CEO of Scale AI, said that the current operating model will result in ruin if the U.S. military doesn't change its ways. He said it will fall far behind other nations, most importantly China, whose government is spending three times more money on AI. The U.S. does have many advantages over China. The U.S. has the largest fleet of military hardware. This fleet generates 22 terabytes of data every day. That's much more than what China's military generates. To give you some perspective, the typical modern laptop has one terabyte of storage space. All this data can be fed into AI systems. But, Wang testified, that advantage is currently being wasted. Right now, a lot of this data goes onto hard drives, and what, en what ends up happening are the hard drives are either overwritten with new information, so the old data gets you know, deleted effectively and lost, or these hard drives go into sort of uh, closets or places where they never see the light of day. Wang also said the Department of Defense is a very fragmented organization made up of many different departments, agencies, and commands. It could be difficult to organize the data from so many different places. Wang said the U.S. should find a way to put that data into a central repository, which AI could then analyze. Another key takeaway, even though China collects massive amounts of data from its own citizens, Wang said that data won't help much with military matters. Militaries need to use military data, which Wang called the ammunition of the future. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry is in Beijing this week for talks about environmental policies. Meanwhile, China yesterday said its economy has nearly stalled. Here to discuss the situation is Senior Fellow in Energy and Environment at the Centennial Institute, Kelly Sloan, whom I spoke with earlier today. Kelly Sloan, thanks for joining us. John Kerry is asking China to follow America's example and cut emissions. But considering China's track record, can they be trusted to keep any promises on climate or otherwise? No, they can't, uh, especially considering that in the last quarters, uh, quarter two, their economy d uh, shrunk to a, p a 08 percent growth. Uh, that means you know they haven't had this the post COVID growth spurt that they were really hoping for. Uh, there's they're they're running into a lot of unemployment, they're running into a lot of other economic problems, and they are not going to hobble their economy any further by advancing uh, some of these climate goals, like uh, getting themselves off of fossil fuels, no matter how much John Kerry uh, begs them to. And following on from that, as a Wall Street Journal opinion piece points out, China won't make climate concessions at the expense of economic growth. Would you agree with this statement and if so, what risk does this pose to the U.S., which does seem willing to make such compromises? Yeah. First of all, yes, I agree absolutely. They are. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping himself has said that they are. You know, they're not going to tie themselves their climate goals to non-realistic uh, expectations on the ground. Uh, so, you know, we we can't really expect them to uh, to meet these goals, whatever their rhetoric might be. And the risk to the U.S., uh, of course, and this is how much we are going to be willing to concede is it going to be trade concessions is it going to be arms sales to taiwan is it going to be security uh, 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 promises to taiwan all those things could be on the table china is looking at this as a bargaining chip not as a serious uh, fight against uh, against climate change or or against pollution in general uh, so that's the risk of the u.s that we come at the table john Kerry is coming at this so desperate for uh, some kind of climate deal to bring China up uh, up to up to our level. And keep in mind, over the last uh, several years, about a decade or so, China's emissions have been growing while the U.S. emissions have been have been dropping. So, no, I think it's entirely unrealistic to expect China to uh, live up to any promise they might make. Now, Kerry's comments of, in China have drawn criticism from some lawmakers. He praised the Chinese Communist Party for increasing green energy sources. But as Senator Marsha Blackburn points out, that work is done using child labor and allegedly Uyghur slave labor. What's your reaction to that? She's absolutely correct. You know, the, uh, uh, we have to keep in mind we're not dealing with an economy like ours. We're not dealing with you know another Western democracy. It's, this isn't like going into negotiations with Germany or or, or Ireland. You know, this is a this is a uh, this is a regime that 
does not respect individual human rights. Uh, they've demonstrated that over and over again, especially under the current regime. So anything that we do, anything whenever we're approaching uh, the People's Republic of China, we need to keep that in mind. We need to keep in mind who we're dealing with and what kind of economy they're based on. Uh, Senator Haggerty said it uh, said it perfectly that everything to the uh, Chinese Communist Party is political. That's an ideological staple uh, staple of theirs. And if we're not looking at our negotiations with them through a realistic lens, it's only going to end up hurting us. Kelly Sloan, Senior Fellow in Energy and Environment at the Centennial Institute. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Coming up, on the eve of the anniversary of China's persecution of Falun Gong, we explore lessons learned under communist rule in a deep dive discussion with the director of the film, The Great Awakening. And in cycling news, the sports governing body has issued a new transgender policy. We hear what a former Olympian has to say, and we return. Stay tuned to get two rolls of Alien Tape free. You wouldn't stick your mother-in-law on the wall, but you could. With Alien Tape, it just sticks. Just peel and stick to make anything stay in place quick. Brick, pavers, marble, tile, plastic, even leather. Nothing works better than Alien Tape. You wouldn't stick your fishbowl on a moving car, but you could with Alien Tape. The secret is nano stick technology that grabs and locks on to secure one side of the surface to the other. Alien Tape secures in seconds, then twist, pull, and rinse to reuse. Call or go online to get your first roll of Alien Tape for just $19.99, plus shipping and processing. But to make this deal really stick, we'll give you two more rolls absolutely free. You get three rolls of Alien Tape for one low price. Order now. To order, call 1-800-490-1364 or go to tryaliantape.com. So call 1-800-490-1364 or order online at tryaliantape.com. There's always a searching process for beauty. You know it when you see it. Does this look familiar? You probably think this is what owning hearing aids would be like. Let me tell you, there's a better way. The Atom by Audion Hearing. The all-new Audion Atom is the world's first wireless charging hearing aid under $100. The Atom comes with an easy-to-use wireless charging dock. Plus, the Atom has a 22% smaller design, so it's nearly invisible when worn in the ear. That's why we have over 250,000 happy customers. Each pair has a 45-day money-back guarantee, so there is zero risk in trying them. Call 1-800-918-3109. That's 1-800-918-3109. Call 1-800-918-3109 or go to audionhearing.com to get your pair of Audion Atom hearing aids for only $99. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here are some of today's top headlines. Former President Trump says he received a letter from Special Counsel Jack Smith telling him that he's a target of the January 6th Jan grand jury probe. Trump says he expects arrest and indictment. President Biden met with Israeli President Isaac Herzog at the White House. Biden underscored his support for Israel amid tensions with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. 
An American soldier is believed to be detained in North Korea after he crossed into the country while visiting the demilitarized zone. The Pentagon is closely monitoring the situation. Welcome back. New disclosures about Dr. Anthony Fauci. President Biden's top COVID-19 advisor allegedly knew that the U.S.-funded Chinese lab was conducting risky experiments, despite his previous denials and downplaying of the claim. Fauci's email in February 2020 referred to the Wuhan lab's gain-of-function experiments. He wrote, there was a suspicion that the mutation was intentionally inserted. Fauci added that scientists in Wuhan University are known to have been working on gain-of-function experiments. The House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic obtained and released the letter. Fauci denied in a 2021 congressional hearing that the Wuhan lab's bat virus study was a gain-of-function one, adding that the U.S. didn't fund such research. Another revelation involves the taxpayer-funded security that Fauci is receiving, though he has retired last December. Files obtained by Fox News' Jesse Waters at prime time reveal that the former White House chief medical advisor is still getting security services from the U.S. Marshals. During a February visit, the U.S. Marshals emailed the White House regarding Fauci's parking issues. In another email, the U.S. responded to three individuals over inappropriate communications about Fauci. And July 20th marks the 24th anniversary of one of the worst human rights abuses in the modern era, the Chinese Communist Party's persecution of the spiritual group Falun Gong. Over the last 24 years, adherents of the faith have tirelessly raised awareness about the CCP's persecution and its other crimes against humanity. In recent years, more people around the world have been coming forth to sound the alarm on the CCP's global agenda and communism spread in the West. Today, we speak with one of those individuals about his new film, The Great Awakening. It's about people worldwide waking up to the threat of communism. Mickey Willis, thanks so much for joining us. Great to have you on our show. Your film is about the mass awakening to the communist agenda around the world. Tell us a bit about that awakening, as you call it, and what set it into motion. Well, I think that the unintended consequence of the COVID uh, tyranny is that it has jolted everyone awake to accept things and at least consider things that before just appear to be outlandish and impossible. We're now recognizing that there is absolutely a concerted effort to control the people, to terrorize us into submission so that we will allow our civil liberties and our human rights to be chipped away at. You've researched communism in depth. Could you explain what you've identified as a plan to plant communism in this country and how it began? Well, if someone would have told me 10 years ago, if they would have even mentioned the word communism, I would have laughed because I had bought into the whole red scare that this stuff is long over and, and just a bunch of old paranoid people would even consider that. And then I started to do my work and to dig into it and to find out how many chapters of communism exist in America and abroad. And it is frightening. But the real wake up for me happened when I was on the road as a documentary filmmaker documenting Bernie Sanders run for president uh, in 2016. And I had met a lot of his the people that were following Bernie's entourage. And so I would ask these young people, why do you have a, a, a symbol of a communist party on your laptop or your water bottle? And they did their best to convince me that this new form of socialism, which they called democratic socialism, would lead to a new form of communism, and then that would ultimately save America and and bring everyone into a state of true equality and balance. And uh, and that's when I realized what was really happening there and that there really was a covert uh, agenda to, uh, and it's been happening for decades, generations, to gradually and now rapidly um, instate communism, a model of communism, which is ultimately just leads to total control of the people. And that's happening right here in the in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thursday marks the anniversary of one of the worst ongoing atrocities committed by a communist regime, the horrific persecution of Falun Gong in China. You included Falun Gong practitioners and other Chinese dissidents in your film. 
What is the importance of listening to the stories of dissidents from communist regimes, and what role do they play in awakening people to the threat of communism? It's a fantastic question, and it's mind-blowing to me that few people listen to the people that actually experienced the situation. And so people are ready to listen to newscasters and, and, and people in the media saying these things don't exist. They don't live there. They've never experienced it. But every dissident from a communist nation that is here in the United States now is saying the exact same thing, and that is wake up, America, because they can recognize if you've lived through something, any experience, you're able to recognize the, um, the steps that it takes to actually bring that into reality. And so they're, they're, they're w witnessing the chipping away at our First Amendment, the attack on the Second Amendment, the, the, the real pull to tear down our Constitution, which is the foundation of America and, and why it's the number one destination for immigration from all over the world, because we have this thing that is supposed to protect the individual. Has the making and reception of this film given you hope? It really has. It's and it's been shocking to me, really, because I I guess I just have grown accustomed to a lot of pushback. And this film has received very little because it's all it's a good thing and, and it's also a scary thing. It's good that that people are accepting this and they're learning from it, but it's it's scary because it means that these ideas are so prevalent. It's so present and in our face that people just can't deny it any longer, which means these agendas are far advanced. And so that's the scary part. If you just go to to see The Great Awakening on YouTube, read the comments. It's, it's quite inspiring because people are really understanding it and, and, and they're doing their own homework. And I would say that's one of the many unintended con consequences of the COVID-19 situation is that it's birthed a generation of citizen journalists. Whereas Absolutely. before people were totally uninformed, most people, of what's happening around the world in politics nationally, internationally, and particularly locally, people now are sharing information daily with each other. And that uh, being informed is really our best, our best weapon and tool. Mickey Willis, director, writer, and producer of The Great Awakening. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your support. I appreciate it. You can watch The Great Awakening for free online at plandemicseries.com. To watch the full interview with Mickey Willis, visit our NTD website. It will be published there on Wednesday. We will also be live streaming the rally in Washington, D.C. to end the persecution of Falun Gong this Thursday. Visit ntd.com for more details. And next, the state of Illinois will be ending cash bail in another two months. This comes after the state's Supreme Court made a ruling on it today. The state's highest court overturned a ruling by a county judge and upheld a state law that bans cash bail. This means that by September 18th, there will be no more cash bail in Illinois for any crime. People will be detained at pretrial only if they pose a threat to the public or are a flight risk. The measure was part of a criminal justice reform bill known as the Safety Act, passed in 2020. It was supposed to go into effect this past January, but was put on hold over legal challenges. The state's attorneys and sheriffs across Illinois filed the lawsuits, claiming the measure would put more criminals back on the streets. Meanwhile, Illinois Attorney General Kwame Raoul, a Democrat, defended the measure. He says pretrial detention shouldn't be determined by a person's ability to pay for bail. And the world of cycling has been in the news recently, but not necessarily for the sport itself. After transgender cyclist Austin Killips won a pair of women's races, female competitors spoke out, and their voices, as well as those of some scientists, have been heard. NTD's Dave Martin has more. Union Cyclist International, or UCI, which is the world governing body of cycling, announced on July 14 that the majority of transgender female athletes would no longer be allowed to compete in the women's category. The rule specifically prohibits any female transgender athlete who's transitioned after puberty to take part in women's competitions. The delicate ruling has prompted strong reactions from both sides of the argument. I was elated and at the same time, um, 
it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one because we know that a lot of the transgender athletes are going to be vastly disappointed. Former Olympic cyclist Inga Thompson, who competed in the 84, 88, and 92 Summer Games, had spoken out against the former policy. It was passed on uh, politics and it was passed on um, ideology. And so it, it has hurt both sides. It has hurt the women and it has hurt the transgender women. And so now that we have fairness back in the sport, um, it's going to take a while for everybody to heal from this. The new policy will likely affect transgender cyclist Austin Killips, who won a 131-mile women's event in North Carolina last month by more than four minutes. The win prompted organizers to create an open category for their next competition, which is unlike the UCI's that simply renamed the male division to the men's open category. Yet some critics have claimed the new policy excludes transgender athletes, something Thompson simply refutes. They can enter the men's category. When I was racing, I was a, a category one pro woman. I raced with the men all the time and they threw me into the pro, uh, pro men um, category one, two. And I mean, I held on for the skin of, you know, from my dear life, you know, trying to race with the men, but I was able to race there. So if I can be a top level woman racing with the pro one, two men, I am positive that they can do it as well. Ultimately, Thompson, who also appreciates the fact that the new policy discourages anyone from taking drugs to qualify for a category, is now greatly encouraged by the new direction in women's sports. It's been a long time coming, and I know it's been difficult, and, and this too shall pass and we'll have fairness back for women in sports. The new policy went into effect on July 17, while the next race in the USA is scheduled for next month in Augusta, Georgia. This is Dave Martin for NTD News. Coming up, heat waves continue to scorch regions around the world. We'll learn more on how to keep cool amid brutal temperatures. And Ford cutting prices for some of its electric vehicles of up to $10,000. What's behind the price cut and should you buy one? We'll have an expert's take after the break. What if you could whiten your teeth by simply brushing your teeth? Now you can with Smile Actives, the teeth whitening breakthrough that safely gets your teeth white and keeps them white every day just by brushing your teeth. I never thought that whitening my teeth could be so easy. I just put the gel on the brush, the toothpaste on it, brush, and I can see my white teeth. Simply add Smile Actives to any toothpaste and our patented PolyClean technology activates into a powerful microfoam that penetrates into the enamel surface to safely lift and remove stains. You need a simple way to whiten your teeth without strips, without trays, without going to the dentist. And it was about time that a product was developed that you would be able to do that with just brushing. And now Smile Actives is even better with new Pro Whitening Gel with 33% greater whitening power, clinically shown to whiten teeth faster, up to eight shades. 100% of users saw whiter teeth on food stains, coffee and wine stains, even on veneers, crowns, and dentures. I eat the blueberries, I drink the coffee, and I know that Smile Actives will keep my teeth white every day. If you could use something so easy like Smile Actives to take yellow teeth to white teeth, why wouldn't you? Why spend hundreds of dollars for whitening treatments at the dentist when now you can whiten your teeth with new Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel every time you brush your teeth? Call or go to smileactives.com and for a limited time, get new Pro Whitening Gel for just $24.95. Order in the next five minutes and buy one, get one absolutely free for just $24.95. That's two for one and save 58%. We'll even include free shipping. Get your teeth whiter guaranteed or return it within 60 days for your money back. I smile every day now. <laughs> The difference is literally night and day. So now I'm always smiling, always choosing, because now my teeth are much whiter. This offer is not available in stores, so call or click now before the special buy one, get one free offer goes away. Being prepared is a part of who you are, but it's especially important in the case of a disaster. Be informed about possible emergencies in your area. Make a plan that covers where you go in an emergency. 
build a kit with the things you need to survive. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Start your plan today. Go to ready.gov slash my plan. Anyone who's ever sold a home will tell you it's really hard. And it's one of the biggest financial decisions you'll ever make. That's why who you work with matters. Together with Homelight, we take care of every detail. Heat waves have gripped parts of Europe in recent days, as well as parts of Asia and the United States. Here at home, a heat wave is also taking over Southern California. How are residents staying safe and protected during the dangerously high temperatures? NTD's Christina Corona tells us how people in Los Angeles are keeping cool. California is experiencing more frequent episodes of extreme heat, creating a greater danger of a heat-related illness. The city of Los Angeles is offering ways to keep cool and beat the heat during this intense heat wave. With the temperatures hovering close to triple digits, Los Angeles County has taken the initiative to establish cooling centers across a variety of locations throughout the area. Many of these centers will be at city recreation and park facilities that all offer shelter and cooling during regular business hours throughout the summer. To find a cooling center near you, you can visit ready.lacounty.gov slash heat. You can also visit Cool Spots LA app at climate4la.org to find a variety of locations to cool off at in your area. They have a list of hydration centers, cooling centers, recreation and park facilities, pools and splash pads, and even libraries available to you to visit. But if you can't make it to a cooling center, try to visit public buildings with air conditioning during the hottest hours of the day if the heat becomes unbearable. Libraries, shopping malls, and movie theaters can all be good places to cool down. Large stores such as Costco and even public transportation can be an alternative way to stay cool. Another way to escape the heat this summer is by taking advantage of the DWP's rebate program. The DWP and Cool LA program is offering a $225 rebate on portable or window unit air conditioners for customers enrolled in one of its discounted rate programs. Customers can qualify if they are enrolled in Easy Safe, Lifeline, Life Support Equipment Discount, and Physician Certified Allowance Discount. If you are not enrolled in any of these programs, they are giving a $75 rebate to all customers who buy a better and more efficient portable wall-mounted or window air conditioner this summer. To receive your rebate and air conditioner, you can visit LADWP.com. So beat the heat, stay hydrated, and take advantage of the cooling opportunities that your city is offering. Christina Corona, NTD News, Los Angeles. Ford is slashing prices by up to $10,000 on some of its electric vehicles. What's behind the price cut? NTD Business's Don Ma gets first-hand information from Lauren Fix, automotive expert at Car Coach Reports. So, Lauren, Ford slashing prices on its F-150 Lightning trucks. You know, I mean... Are they doing this out of the kindness of their heart? Are, are they just being considerate to the consumer? Um, you know, are they making these uh, trucks more affordable because of Tesla um, price wars? I mean, just tell us what, what is happening here. Well, I'm actually at a Ford event now. So I spoke with a couple of internals to get some real information. You know, you can look at it from two perspectives. You can say, oh, they're not selling them. So they're doing a price cut and they're trying to compete with Tesla. So they're going to have a price cut. That's one perspective. Ford saying, and this is from their words, is that they're building 150,000 of these Ford Lightning trucks this year. Um, and there's some information that goes with that. Uh, Ford also says that they're scaling production, so they're lowering costs. So now let's take a step back and look at the facts. Ford just took $9.2 billion of your tax dollars to build a battery plant in Detroit. Now that loan has to be paid back at some point, and Ford hopes that they're going to do it based on electric car sales. Now let's take a look at real electric car sales. 
I have friends that own dealership groups in Michigan, and right now they have what they call turns. How often the car sits on the lot when that vehicle sells. So that how many turns do you have? A good turn is like 15 days. So a car sits there no longer than 15 days, it's sold. Right now, the EVs that are in Michigan, this is just from yesterday, there's a 92-day turn. 92 days. That's three months. So there's something called floor planning. When vehicles come in, they don't pay for the vehicle up front. They pay for the interest on that, and that is financed. And when that vehicle is sold, they pay it off, and the usual car transaction. So if that vehicle stays for three months, 92 days, that means every single month that vehicle sits, it's costing the dealer money. Now, the dealer is a franchise. And whether you like dealers or not, the manufacturers are pushing these out, but they're not selling. So right now, every dealer in Michigan has between two and five Lightnings and the Mach-E, which is their SUV. And it's not just Ford. It's General Motors. It's every single electric car are not selling. So it seems like price is not the biggest obstacle here. Ford is slashing prices, but it seems like mm -hmm. consumers have other concerns. Right. And, and think about this. If you're liberal we'll to say for average, you're cutting close to $10,000 off the car. You get a $7,500 tax credit from the federal government and your state might offer $2,500 and maybe your company offers $1,000 depending upon who you work for. There's a lot of different ways to save money. You could save up to $20,000 on a truck that's $80,000, still getting you a $60,000 truck, uh, but you're still looking at a lot of money. And, and people are looking at that plus insurance, plus the economy. I think they're taking a second look at this may not work for me. You can buy all kinds of power walls. Ford offers one. Tesla offers one. You can put in your home. You always have charging at home. But that doesn't work if you're actually going to be driving places and it limits your freedom. And I think people are starting to see that. Have consumers decided this doesn't work for me? Every time I go to a charging station, which I just talked to someone who was in northern Michigan who told me they had uh, a Ford Lightning truck they were testing. They got there. There were four stations. Two of them were working. One had a Hummer in it and it was going to be there for a long time because it's a very large battery. And they sat there and they charged for four hours just to get them to their destination, which didn't have a charger or they had one that was broken. So these are problems that consumers get frustrated. It'd be like you're pulling into a gas station and there's no fuel or they're not pumping today. You you get aggravated, but there's other gas stations. And in case of charging stations, there's a lot of limitations. And I think that's what's making customers think twice about buying one. Well, all right. Seems like a lot of hurdles facing the EV market. Um, but thank you so much today, Laura. Pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. San Francisco's iconic Anchor Brewing, known for pioneering craft beers in the 1970s, will be closing its doors after struggling with declining sales amid challenging economic conditions. Frequent customers say they'll be sad to see it go. After years of declining sales due to tough economic conditions, San Francisco's famous Anchor Brewing will close down and sell off its assets. Known for its innovative brewing techniques, Anchor Brewing gained popularity in the 1970s and became a sought-after brand nationwide. It's very sad. I'm a native San Franciscan and I've been drinking the beer as long as I can remember. It's one of my favorites and it's um, like losing an old friend. You gotta come here. This is the oldest brewery in California. This is the one that is like kind of legacy breweries that's still around and it's fun to go to. There's a lot of other newer beers with tastier beers, but this one's the, the one to go to. However, the rise of canned cocktails, spirits, and wines, along with the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns, made it challenging for brewers to turn a profit. Despite efforts to find a buyer, the company was unsuccessful. San Francisco locals expressed shock at the news and rushed to buy remaining inventory and merchandise. Uh, we definitely had to come down, uh, get our hands on whatever anchor we could bring back home and, you know, come see the brewery and enjoy a steam beer one last time here in San Francisco. While brewing operations have stopped, packaging and distribution will continue until the end of the month. However, there may be one last attempt to save Anchor Brewing. Since the closure announcement, 24 individual investors have expressed interest in buying part or all of the company. Now, if you have any news tips or feedback for our show, remember you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. But that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.